Are you tired of arguing about climate change with your uncle or your co-worker or that weird person online? Welcome to the club. Now, if you really want to keep banging your head on that wall, I'm not here to stop you. But I am here to try and give you some facts that might help. Because even though you are almost certainly not going to convince those people, it is often worth trying to combat some of that misinformation for the people that are listening in or lurking in the comments. You are probably not going to convince the guy who thinks that all scientists are evil and funded by like solar, but that's not really why we do it. Misinformation is freaking annoying and it spreads four times faster than facts. But most importantly, it also stops us doing what we need to do to stop the planet heating up and boiling the oceans. So today for this episode of Microgreens, I thought I would talk about some of the myths I see quite often in my comment section, parroted by climate change deniers, but also how you can talk about things like climate change a little bit more effectively if you're a masochist. Kia ora, I'm Brianne West, and this is Now That's What I Call Green, where I talk about all things science, sustainability, and nature. Now, before we begin, a note on the term climate change denier. It's a terrible term. Denial implies some kind of belief in something unproven. Climate change isn't a belief system like religion or ghosts. There is terabytes of evidence and data that has been collected by tens of thousands of scientists for decades. And actually, many of those scientists started out as skeptics themselves, but they changed their mind with the evidence. And that's a key point, right? Climate change deniers often call themselves climate skeptics. But to be a skeptic, you actually have to follow the evidence and change your mind accordingly. And most people who don't like climate change don't do that. We should all be skeptics, right? That is the keystone of science, by and large. Nullius in verba is the Latin motto for probably the oldest science institute on earth the Royal Society. And it just means take nobody's word for it. And that's exactly how science works. People don't just believe things blindly. They look at the evidence for and against a hypothesis, and then they make their minds up accordingly. You can't just trust some guy with a podcast microphone. Practically speaking, of course, we can't become experts on everything. So how do you know who to trust? Well, there's a couple of things to look for. Look for people who openly share their work, how they got there, their methodology, their calculations. If they don't want to show it, Hmm, maybe it's a bit dodgy. Look for people whose findings withstand scrutiny from other experts in their field. That's what peer reviewing is. Look for people who admit that there are still gray areas or things they don't understand because we don't know everything about almost anything. And most importantly, look for people who change their mind when the evidence changes. So from now on, I'm going to call climate deniers the climate confused because I think that's suitably patronizing. But to be perfectly honest, the good news is that it doesn't really matter what we call them. And we don't actually need to change the minds of this tiny group of people. They're actually way smaller than you think. They're just loud. 85% of people around the world are concerned about climate change and want governments to do more about it. So that 15%, meh. But have you ever wondered why climate change is so politicized and why people have such aggressive opinions about it? Well, you can thank oil companies, as always. Back in the 1970s, fossil fuel companies started to realize that if people really knew about climate change, it probably wouldn't be good for business. There is evidence back from the 1800s, scientists knew about the idea of the greenhouse gas effect and that if we poured loads of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, there would be consequences. Fossil fuel companies had solid evidence since the 40s and 50s and just hit it just like they did with tobacco. So they knew that this probably wasn't going to be good for business. So they started pouring tens of millions of dollars into propaganda campaigns. Exxon alone, I think in one year, spent $30 million funding a think tank that simply existed to muddy the waters and confuse people, which is exactly what tobacco companies did because the science that smoking tobacco led to lung and other cancers was well known well before cigarettes were ever restricted. And this worked so well because of us. We are not very good at dealing with threats that aren't immediate. Our brains like clear, obvious threats like being chased by a lion, not sea level rise in a couple of decades. The other thing, of course, is Denial is a powerful coping mechanism. So many people feel that the solutions to resolving climate change are massive things they don't want to give up. So they just shut down, head in the sand it is. But that isn't going to help. But then, of course, for the true deniers or the extra confused, it's not about science or evidence. It's about ego. It's about identity. It's about belonging. Often these guys start out because of repeated exposure to misinformation, their peer influence or alignment with, say, political groups that ignore science and dismiss climate action as unnecessary. Yes, often funded by oil companies. And over time, this becomes part of their ego and their identity. Admitting climate change is real and, and saying they were wrong is something they fundamentally cannot do. At that point, it's more about loyalty and ego than it is about evidence or saving the planet. And that is exactly why arguing is largely pointless. It isn't anything to do with evidence. You could throw all the facts that you have at them and it will make not one iota of difference. But if you want to subject yourself to the frustration, here are the myths. Number one, climate has always changed. It's just a cycle and it's got nothing to do with us. Yeah, 
the Earth's climate has always changed. It is a cycle. We have gone from ice age to temperate periods like now, but never at the speed and never at the scale. So for context, atmospheric CO2 stayed between 180 and 280 parts per million for the past 800,000 years. Today, due almost exclusively to fossil fuel use, we're seeing at 420 parts per million. And that level has not been seen in the Earth's atmosphere for millions of years. And it might sound tiny, right, parts per million. But when you consider that the difference in Earth's history between ice ages and warmer periods is as little as 100 parts per million, you start to understand that actually maybe that's quite a lot. Human activity accounts for 90% of current global warming and natural factors like volcanoes or solar flares cannot explain the spike. It's basic physics. If you pump billions of tonnes of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, it's obviously going to trap more heat. Number two is the idea that more CO2 means more plant growth. And I guess I can understand this one a little bit more. It sort of makes some sense. To a certain level, a greater concentration of CO2 in the air does make plants grow faster. But it's to a certain point, right? More is not always more. Consider it like oxygen. We need oxygen. The air you're breathing right now is about 20.8% oxygen. At about 50%, you would start to have seizures, you start to have brain and lung damage. It would be very unpleasant. Carbon dioxide works exactly the same way. Increased CO2 means warmer temperatures, intensified droughts, unpredictable weather, nutrient-poor soils. And studies show that crops that are grown in those higher CO2 environments often lose vital nutrients like zinc and iron, even further jeopardizing food security. Number three is the idea that a couple of degrees doesn't matter. And again, I get this one too, because it sounds realistic. We're talking about a very small amount of change, theoretically. We are currently at about 1.2, 1.3 degrees of change. And we're saying that we want to hold it at 1.5, which we have almost no chance of doing now. It is too late. But we definitely want to hold it under two because every single fraction of a degree makes a difference. I talked about this extensively in the main episode this week. It's a bit grim and a bit of a harsh listen because it's what we will face if we hit two degrees. But the too long, didn't read version is even a small temperature increase makes an enormous difference. It dramatically increases the heat energy and the water vapor in the air, which leads to much stronger storms, much more frequent storms. It dries out the soil, causes droughts. I could go on. Of course, by two degrees, most of the coral reefs will be gone and 25% of marine species rely on coral reefs. But of course, almost all All of the remaining species rely on some of those species that have something to do with corals. So our already struggling oceans won't have a great time. Every fraction of a degree matters, even if it seems small. Number four is that it's too late and it's just too expensive to do anything about climate change. And both are emphatically wrong. This one very specifically comes from the oil companies because if you can't win with a misinformation campaign, you can definitely make people feel it's not worth trying because apathy is a very easy thing to elicit in people. Economically, at the end of the day, renewable energy is now about 80% cheaper than fossil fuels. It does not make economic sense to be funding more coal mines almost anywhere. In 2023, over 80% of the renewable energy projects that were funded were infinitely cheaper than the cheapest fossil fuel alternatives. So basically, building a wind farm is infinitely cheaper than building a coal plant. And timing-wise, it's absolutely not too late. Yes, it's too late for 1.5 degrees, but we want to do everything we can to prevent further warming. I have now said it three times. It really bears repeating. Every fraction of a degree makes a difference. And then finally, number five is that there is no scientific consensus. And this one also comes from oil propaganda. About 97% of climate specialists agree that climate change is urgent, is worsening, and is anthropogenic. So we did it. And it doesn't really matter what other scientists and other fields argue because they're not the experts. So a dermatologist telling you that they don't believe in climate change because they don't think the science is there yet is kind of irrelevant. They may be a skin expert, but they know nothing about the climate. And this is where it's really important to consider someone's expertise in the relevant area. 97% is about as solid as consensus will get in science. It's about the same level of consensus we had when scientists were telling us that tobacco caused cancer. And yet we don't have great swathes of people out there in the wilderness arguing that tobacco causing cancer is just a scheme cooked up by big lung. Fossil fuel companies bankrolled this as well because creating this illusion of disagreement made it seem like, oh, maybe it wasn't real after all. If you want any resources or proof of what I am saying, they are all in the show notes. But now you have the knowledge to combat some of these myths. How do you do it in an effective way? Because the number one thing we can actually do to combat climate change is talk about it. And yet so many people don't want to. Because so many of us feel like we're the only one that cares about it. And we feel silly. 85% of people care, don't forget that. But the first thing to consider when you're entering into a debate with someone is to realize that most people aren't actually evil. 
Some people are. But most people all want the same thing, right? Happy, healthy families, friends, environments. So start with figuring out what it is they do care about. People aren't going to change their minds because you've given them some data, but they might change their mind when they see how that issue will affect their world and what they care about. So don't throw out abstract statistics about sea level rise. Talk about how the flood last year down the road was caused by climate change or how insurance rates keep going up or how some homes soon won't be insurable. Link climate impacts to things that affect them and their family because they will already be experiencing these impacts. They just necessarily haven't linked the two. Climate scientist Catherine Hayhoe talks about this all the time as the single most impactful way to talk about it. Start with shared values. Don't make it a fight. No one has ever lost an argument and gone, you know what? You were right. I'm sorry. I was wrong. That's not how it works. So you have to keep your cool. The moment you get emotional in an argument, you lose it, which I know is way easier said than done. But the second you get angry or combative, they get defensive and you've lost. It's no longer about logic. It's just about both of you defending your position. So know when to step back and walk away. This is a favorite of mine in most conversations, actually, is to ask questions. People will say some of the most insane things and they love asking them about why. Where did they get that from? Why did they believe it? What evidence have they seen? So often they can't answer them or they answer them in a very peculiar way or they get defensive. And that's annoying. But those are little like nibbles, if you like, into their armor that will start to make them think later on, why do they believe that thing they believe? We should all be self-aware enough to think about what we think, but most people don't. Two of the most impactful questions in my experience are, what evidence would actually change your mind? And where did you hear that from? Have you heard the phrase, they say, or they told me about this? Have you asked them who they is? It's usually fascinating. It's quite often a guy with a podcast, but again, it makes them think. Where did I hear that from? Was it a good source? Can I trust that person or am I just parroting something? And by asking the questions, you're not only finding out some information that maybe you could refute in a kind way, but you're also making them think about it. And instead of being defensive, hopefully they'll remain thoughtful. This only works for people who are open-minded or self-aware or even just curious, not for everybody. And then, of course, you need to know when to leave it. There is a point when this conversation stops being productive. If you are talking to someone who says that climate change is a plot by the UN to ban meat and internal combustion cars and install the world government and they're actual secretly lizards, you're done. That's not a debate. That person is a conspiracy theorist and it doesn't matter what you say, you're not going to change anything and it's just going to cost you energy, make you frustrated and make you sort of lose a little bit of faith in humans. Your energy is better spent elsewhere, ideally with people who are curious, not confused. Now, you're probably not going to change someone's mind with one conversation, but you might open a door. You might start them thinking about why they think something. And even if you don't, there's always other people listening or watching or reading the comments who might be quietly thinking, hmm, that actually makes sense. And that is worth it. Knowledge is power. And I hope that was helpful. But if you like this episode, you will love this week's main episode. It's got a whole lot more information. Although, content warning. It's a bit dark, but it ends on a cheerful note. I'll see you next week for a chat with another scientist talking about science communication. Kia ora.